Uh, good morning. Um, glad to see everybody this morning. And uh, I'd like to uh, change the focus a little bit from uh, the future to a little bit of the past. Uh, I'd like to give you a little uh, uh, discussion about uh, Sir Arthur Clarke and the space elevator <clears throat> and how he affected the, uh, the development and the publicity for the space elevator. Uh, so much so that uh, some people think that Arthur Clarke invented the space elevator. Uh, but he's been a very uh, big uh, factor in the development of the space elevator. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, I have a small company in uh, South Carolina. I started technology and research. Since I retired from NASA and the Air Force, I've been working on small business innovation research. And right now, we're looking with, uh, with NASA at a uh, be able to get rid of the debris, which uh, endangers the space elevator. So we'd like to do our part and kind of clean up space to uh, make, make space safer for space elevators. Uh, 
uh, Sage of Science Fiction, which was done uh, as a surprise for him uh, by people all over the world who got together and brought in things, and they took him to a hotel and gave him a great feast, and, uh, and it was a complete surprise to him, so that was, that was a great time. All right, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Uh, Arthur began this about 1945. He, uh, when he was in the uh, Royal Air Force, he uh, came up with this uh, idea for uh, extraterrestrial relays. Uh, did a small article in Wireless World where he envisioned three satellites equally spaced around the Earth in, in geosynchronous orbit, uh, in which he could communicate from satellite to satellite and from any spot on the Earth to any other spot using those satellites. And amazingly enough, it didn't take more than about 17 or 18 years until the first uh, actual geostationary communication satellite was, was in place, uh, CENCOM 2 in 1963. It wasn't, it wasn't geostationary, it was geosynchronous because it had an inclination, so it traced out a figure eight in the sky. But in, in 63, uh, in 64, CENCOM 3 was the first actual geostationary satellite. Now there's about 416 active satellites in what uh, is being called Clark Orbit. So it's really exploded since uh, Arthur came up with that idea. Next slide. Interestingly enough, Arthur was the one who inspired me uh, to come up with the idea of the space elevator. I heard his testimony to Congress in about 1969, and he was describing uh, geostationary space satellites. And he said, there they are, perched above imaginary towers, 35,800 kilometers high. And I thought, hmm, why not make a real tower? So I thought about it for a while, came up with the, uh, the, the space elevator idea uh, in about 1970. I worked it out, and then it took me five years to get published. After I published it in 75, my world tower paper in Act Astronautica, Arthur saw that, and he wrote me a letter. Uh, I had all kinds of questions about it, and he had written an article about space elevators and wanted to learn more, and he was really intensely interested in that. And the reason for that was he was already planning to do his first uh, space elevator novel, The Fountains of Paradise. Uh, I didn't know that right away, but I knew he was very inquisitive and in asking all kinds of questions. So that began our long correspondence uh, in, in uh, 1976. Uh, and then, of course, just two years later, he came out with The, with the Fountains of Paradise. Next slide. Uh, the next thing that happened was uh, right before the uh, the 1976 International Astronautical Congress, the IAC. It was held in uh, Anaheim, California, and it was part of the U.S. Uh, bicentennial uh, celebration, and I, and I presented my first paper on the space elevator at that point. It was something called uh, Using Orbital Tower to Launch Earth, Earth Escape Spacecraft Daily. I was looking at launching uh, things up the space elevator and releasing them at the top and letting them go to various places like Moon, Mars, uh, or Jupiter. And I was, as I was preparing my paper and getting ready for that conference, I got that first letter from Arthur. And uh, wow, that was exciting, because Arthur had been my hero since I was a teenager, and here he was writing to me, and I thought, oh, okay, yeah, I've reached the pinnacle right now. So that was a lot of fun. And, uh, and then I went to that conference, and I met uh, a couple of other illustrious characters. Uh, Robert Forward, uh, who some of you may have heard about, he did uh, interstellar uh, light sails, and, uh, <coughs> Laser push light sails for interstellar travel. Uh, and great, he was a great guy also. And uh, Georg von Tiesenhausen, uh, who was one of the uh, paperclip guys, that came from uh, uh, Finnemundi. Uh, he was down at the Martian Space Center. And I was uh, lamenting to him that uh, space elevators took such a strong material. What are we going to do? And he said, Why don't you look at the moon? It might be a little easier to do one around the moon. So that set me off on, on looking at lunar space elevators. And so I did that. So that was an exciting summer uh, with, with Arthur writing to me and, and meeting all these guys. Next slide. Uh, in that first letter to me, Clark really dug in to the uh, questions and problems and situations about the space elevator. He addressed the collision problem right at the very beginning. I hadn't even thought about that yet, but uh, he was already thinking, all this junk in space, all these things up there, uh, he was expecting something like 10 to the 4th, 10 to the 6th object to be in space. And about that time, you know, Space Man's now looking at about 21,000 objects. So he was pretty close. Uh, back in 76, uh, estimating what the, uh, the traffic was going to be like in, in, in this day and age. 
He also wondered how to propel those high-speed climbers, which is one of the uh, topics we're going to be talking about at this conference this week. Um, he wondered, uh, can, you, uh, can you take uh, power conducted through the tower? Can, can that be used uh, like an electric railroad to power the tethers of, of the, uh, the climbers of the tether? Or can you uh, radiate uh, energy from solar power satellites to try to power the climbers up there? So he was, he was looking at these things uh, at the very beginning. He also looked at where do you locate the base for stability? And he was aware of the geopotential uh, spots around the Earth. And there's two stable spots, basically, uh, uh, 75 east longitude and 105 west. And of course, 75 east longitude turned out to be very close to uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, that's where he put the base for the uh, space elevator in his novel, The Fountains of Paradise. Uh, when he asked me where to locate the base, uh, he, he thought 75 east. I said, well, how about 105 west at the other stable point? But since there's no land there, let's just curve the lower part of it and attach it to Mexico. And then we can accelerate things along the ground to start with from Mexico, and then they go up the tower along the space. He didn't take me up on that. <laughs> he also had a couple other ideas. He thought, hey, why can't we use the space elevator uh, as a kind of a vertical pipeline? And, uh, send fluids into orbit, but he thought, well, we'd have to have a pretty high pumping pressure at the bottom, so he kind of gave up on that idea. But another idea he came up with was, why not use a space elevator to dissipate the radiation belts? Because that's a pretty dangerous area you have to go through, and if you've got to go over the geo, uh, you have to go through that area. That's, that's dangerous. You have to have radiation shielding and all that. And uh, he thought, let's use it to, to dissipate those radiation belts, the particles. Uh, and actually, uh, just a few years ago, uh, DARPA actually funded programs to look at doing that with uh, the long tethers. So he was uh, pretty prescient in, in this area. He talked to people all over the world. He knew, it seems he knew everybody. And he would ask people for advice. And when he was researching this topic, he really dug into it. So he asked uh, Walter Morgan of, of Compton Corporation, uh, what about the dynamics of this kind of thing? And uh, just as, uh, Pete was uh, alluding to before, uh, they came up with an oscillation that was going to happen in the uh, north-south direction. It turns out the tip of that thing would oscillate back and forth for a period of one day. Stable oscillation, but a fairly large amplitude of about seven and a half degrees each direction. That's uh, 22,000 kilometers. So uh, at the top of that thing, it's going to be moving about 900 kilometers an hour, 560 miles an hour, just going north and south in a stable oscillation, but once a day. So that was pretty scary. <laughs> and I guess we're still we're trying to work with that. Next slide, please. Uh, he did a lot of research in the history of the idea, looking up other inventions and so forth. And because he was a cataloger for uh, Physics Today for a long time, and he was uh, responsible for uh, cataloging new uh, uh, information coming in. So he did a lot of research. And he uncovered, uh, here we are to Tanoff's uh, uh, paper in, in the uh, Pravda. And he also uh, uncovered a couple of others. Uh, he finally met Yuri in, in 1982. Uh, when he started looking for him in the late 70s, couldn't find him. They thought maybe he was dead or, or unavailable. But he did finally locate him. And in 82, he actually went to uh, Leningrad at that time and then talked with Yuri. That's when he first uh, met him there. Uh, he also discovered uh, the British author's collar and flower. Uh, that was a near invention of space elevator. Uh, that's where they talked about the elongation of the uh, geostationary satellite down to a lower altitude where you could be closer to the Earth and help in the communications. They were thinking that that, that would help uh, cut down the power required from geostationary uh, satellites and all that. And they made this a mar marvelous statement in their, in their uh, paper. They said, uh, actually, you could extend it all the way down to the surface of the Earth if we went to. And they stopped right there. And they, they had the space elevator and didn't realize it. So uh, that was, it was pretty interesting. And there was a, a couple of others that did that. I found that US authors who did the same thing. And they, and they didn't realize they had a space elevator. One of the US authors said uh, it would be able to support a small payload all the way down to the Earth's surface. So, and then they stopped. So quite interesting. And uh, Arthur also discovered Hans Moravec. And uh, Hans came up with a slightly different version of the, of the space elevator. 
You know, the classical geostationary space elevators is one instance of a space elevator. But if you look at a uh, generalized view of that, uh, he looked at a rolling satellite which went around the Earth and, and the tips touched the Earth at various points. And he found you could arrange it to touch at various points, uh, as many points as you wanted to. The geostationary uh, satellite touches at one spot. He could have one touch at two spots or three spots or all around. And he optimized that and said, hey, this is the way to do a, do a space elevator now. So that was pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, and then at the same time, I discovered uh, uh, Paul Birch's uh, orbital rings and uh, Keith Lofstrom's Lost Loop and Rod Hyde's uh, Space Fountain, which were all different ways of, of trying to approach the uh, uh, space elevator. Uh, I'm surprised that uh, Paul Birch's stuff didn't get more interest. That was uh, presented in a series of articles in JBIS. Journal of the British Interplanetary Society, and uh, in the early 70s, and uh, uh, hardly anybody paid attention. That's surprising. Next slide. Two years later, 78, Clark came out with uh, the Fountains of Paradise, his first uh, space elevator novel, and uh, what he claimed was going to be his last novel, but uh, turned out not to be the case. Uh, he sent me a copy of it and described it for me. Next slide. Uh, it, he uh, put the base of the space elevator on a mountain peak there in Sri Lanka, Atmos Peak, I think it's called. And uh, so he sent me this little postcard in 78 saying, this is the first time I've been able to take a picture of one of the locales of my science fiction novels. So he was quite excited about being able to get to that spot. So uh, that was one I've never been there. I, I went to Sri Lanka and I visited him in Colombo, but I never made it up to uh, Atmos Peak. I didn't have time to do that. Although he did take other people up there. Uh, he took uh, uh, Robert Heinlein and his wife up for a visit one time. A lot of people visited him there in Sri Lanka, uh, including Heinlein and also John Isaacs, uh, the oceanographer who had uh, come up with the idea of the space elevator as well. <coughs> uh, he also got visits from uh, Buckminster Fuller, uh, that, that um, great thinker who uh, came up with the uh, uh, the geodesic uh, spheres and, and those kinds of constructions. And uh, he did the cover illustration for Arthur's, uh, uh, an album of uh, the Fountains of Paradise. Uh, sometimes they record uh, books and things like that. Arthur did that and they put it out on, a, on, a, on an LP, one of those ancient things, uh, kind of a record about a foot across, you know, 23 and third RP and those, those kinds of historical things. Uh, and this was the cover of that done. And, and Bucky Fuller indicated that back in the early 50s, he had thought of a tensegrity ring completely around the Earth, uh, rotating at a slightly different velocity than the Earth was rotating, so that she could grab onto the thing and then uh, move around and drop off at some other spot on the Earth, a completely free transportation system. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, Nikola Tesla, had come up with that same kind of idea in the, in the 1890s. So it seems there's hardly anything new under the sun, you know. Next slide. Uh, my first chance to meet Arthur was in 1979. The IAC was in Munich, and uh, he had done all this research on space elevators and the history and that sort of thing, and he was ready to give the uh, uh, paper on that. And so he was invited to give the plenary talk at the IAC in Munich. And I thought, great, I'll, uh, I'll go to that too. So I put in an abstract for a uh, paper on asteroid retrieval. But uh, I made one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made in my life in that. Uh, I sent this abstract in. Uh, we, uh, we wrote up abstracts in those days by using something called a typewriter. <laughs> you punch these things and you, and you put the writing on the paper and all that. And then you folded up that paper and you put an envelope to mail it. And but it could go anywhere in the world, you know. I neglected to send it airmail. And it went by circus ship, who knows, by way of slow boat to China, I don't know. But my abstract didn't get there in time, and so I didn't have a paper for that conference. I asked the Air Force to let me go anyway, and they said, nah, no paper, no trip. So I missed my first chance to meet Arthur at the 79 conference. And it was a great time. He, he gave the uh, plenary address, and it was really a great, uh, a great conference here. Um, I curse myself every time that I, I fouled up on that one, but uh, I always say I've got to have another chance at something. Next slide. 
that same year was when I published my uh, lunar space elevator on Journal of the Astronomical Sciences. And there I had followed uh, Georg von Tiesenhausen's suggestion to look at the moon. So I looked at doing a, a space elevator on the moon. Uh, it would, it's a little bit more difficult mathematical problem because you don't have a geostationary ring uh, around the moon like you do the Earth. But you can build space elevators about the two Lagrangian ones, L1 and L2. Right, L, uh, yeah, L1 and L2. The L1 is on the nearer side toward the Earth, and L2 is on the far side. Uh, so I looked at balancing about L1 and going down to the lunar equator. But since all the good stuff like water and so forth are at the poles, I had to have a, uh, a tramway that went, went from the equator down to the pole. And then you would carry things from there and you'd bring the things up from the, from the pole, uh, put them in tanks, run along the tramway and then up to the, uh, the space elevator. You go past the L1 point far enough and you can drop the thing off and it'll go into a high Earth orbit. And then with ion rockets, you can uh, circularize it and take it to the Earth orbit. And at the same time, you can pick up things in Earth orbit and bring them back to the moon. So this was the idea for the, uh, the lunar space elevator. And once you have the Earth space elevator and the lunar space elevator, you can get rid of those nasty rockets that uh, Pete was talking about and have a great transportation system. Next slide. So uh, it was some pretty exciting times, thinking we could just get rid of all those rockets, uh, use uh, carbon nanotubes, and uh, build space elevators of various sorts, and uh, completely uh, uh, change the way of getting into space. Next slide. Uh, an interesting aside that many people may not realize, uh, Arthur was a little bit of a, uh, he was an internationalist and a little bit of a pacifist. He was a little bit concerned about the militarization of space and things like that. So it was an interesting time in the 80s when uh, President Reagan came in and he was talking about his strategic defense initiative, uh, Star Wars they called it, and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, as a matter of fact, I worked on that when I was working for the Air Force. I, I worked on uh, uh, space-based lasers and kinetic kill vehicles and we were ready to figure out how to do those things and uh, destroy the Soviet Union. And uh, uh, there was a big meeting uh, at Barney Oliver's place. Uh, they called a Star Wars party in 1984. Heinlein was there. Uh, General Daniel Graham was there. Lowell Wood, uh, and Hans Mark, Arthur Clark, and others attended. And uh, they discussed uh, Star Wars and, and the uh, SDI and all that. Heinlein was really in favor of doing this, but Clark was, uh, he was actually opposed to it. He thought it was destabilizing, dangerous, and might lead to World War III. So they had a falling out about that. And uh, uh, so Clark uh, was uh, not, not on the military side in those days. Well, it turned out that uh, uh, because of SDI, the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, and the evil empire collapsed in 1991. But Heinlein and Clark never reconciled. And uh, they stayed apart the rest of their lives. Uh, and uh, Arthur told me this story when I visited him in Sri Lanka in 1996, which uh, had surprised me. So, uh, he was actually uh, opposed to SDI. Next slide. My second chance to meet Arthur <clears throat> was in 1987. Uh, in Russia, they were having the 30th anniversary of the Sputnik launch from 57. And uh, Arthur was invited. Uh, and I was invited. Uh, Arthur turned it down because of work. I still wanted to go. But uh, the nice thing about it was the Russians were going to offer me free transportation from New York to Moscow, uh, putting me up at a hotel, all expenses paid over there. All I had to do was get myself to New York. Well, rather than just take leave from the Air Force and go to New York and do it on my own, I went through channels and I said, uh, can I go on this trip officially? That was in the middle of the Cold War, 1980. 87. I mean, it was really hot at that time. Uh, Reagan was president, SDI was going on, and all these things were happening. That request went all the way up to the Secretary of Defense, Casper Weinberger. And Casper took one look at that and said, This thing in Moscow uh, in celebration is going to be an anti SDI demonstration. So no DOD personnel will, will go to that. So uh, he turned down my request. Uh, and that uh, taught me a lesson there. When you're in the military, it's better to do it and ask for forgiveness rather than ask for permission in the first place. Learn that lesson. Uh, 
Finally, I was able to uh, meet Arthur and visit him in Sri Lanka. And there was an IAC in Bangalore in 1988. In Bangalore, idiot. <coughs> And that wasn't too far, so I decided to do a little side trip and visit him. He was there at the time, so I went to him out of his house in, in, uh, in Sri Lanka. And this is this is a picture taken at that time. Uh, it was interesting. I was trying to call him up and, and uh, uh, try to uh, arrange the time to make sure that we're okay. And uh, I called the operator. I had the wrong number. And uh, I told the operator in Sri Lanka I was trying to reach Arthur Clark. Oh, Arthur Clark, here's the number. <laughs> and apparently, all the operators in Sri Lanka knew Arthur Clark's number by heart. <laughs> and uh, same thing when I, uh, I, I got into a taxi and asked him to take me to uh, Arthur's address. Oh, Arthur Clark's place, huh? So he took me off. Everybody knew him. He was, he was the most famous citizen in Sri Lanka. So, and the second time I got a chance to meet him was uh, at the IAC in, in Beijing. And, 1996. We got together in Singapore after that. He was trying to get his computer repaired, and so he couldn't do that in Sri Lanka, so he took it to, to Singapore. So we met at the uh, holiday in there in Singapore and had a, had a great discussion about things, too. That's when he told me the story about uh, Heinlein and, and SDI and all that. Next slide. About this time, they were looking for the strong materials which they built the space elevator out of, and uh, Richard Smalley was doing his work at Rice University. And they come up from, from uh, Buckminster Fullerene, the C60 molecule, to uh, the uh, carbon nanotubes. And I remember uh, one day, uh, Boris Jacobson called me up and said, all right, Pearson, we've got the material to build your space elevator with now. We're ready to go. He was really excited. Well, that was in the laboratory at the time. And that was in the 90s. And it's still in the laboratory. It may be coming out as a workable composite sometime, but who knows when. So, next slide. You know, there are implications of strong material like that. If you have something strong enough to build a space elevator with, it can do other things. In Arthur Clarke's novel, Founds of Paradise, he talked about uh, his, his uh, uh, hero, uh, Morgan, uses a fiber in a handheld climber to uh, uh, help him climb up the side of a mountain and things like that. And he also mentioned being able to use his fiber to just cut down trees because it was so strong and, and thin and, and, and sharp. Uh, my thought was, uh, this stuff could also be used uh, to uh, make uh, spacecraft lighter and make it possible to do a single stage orbit. And if you do a single stage orbit, they can take off from an airport, go into space, come back and land at an airport. That's really formidable competition to a space elevator. So I was kind of worried that uh, the strong material is going to work against us as well as it is in our favor. So it's still not clear how that's going to play out. But, uh, that was one of my concerns. Uh, another item I'd like to mention is, is space elevator and portable rings. There's been an interesting um, uh, uh, comparison of those. Uh, in Arthur's 3001, The Final Odyssey, he has four orbital towers, he calls them, uh, equally spaced around the equator. And he also mentions a geostationary ring of attached satellites. So he, has, he actually has a ring there. Now, he realized that uh, a rigid ring, uh, like the one in Larry Newman's ring world, would be unstable. It's sort of gravitationally neutral. If it goes to one side, one side falls down on the Earth because the gravity gets greater. Uh, so you have to stabilize that, or you have to have a very light connection between them. Uh, and he envisioned light connections between these geostationary satellites so that it wouldn't be unstable. That was kind of interesting. But I mentioned to him uh, about orbital rings in a letter to Arthur, and I talked about Paul Birch and, and that approach to uh, space elevators, but he never took me up on the idea. Uh, also, there was a uh, Arnold and Kingsbury had the idea for an electrodynamic uh, uh, accelerator in space. It would be a long tube in lower Earth orbit, and you would launch something up in a suborbital trajectory, and it would go into that tube, and that tube would accelerate the, uh, the payload uh, electrodynamically until it was up to orbital velocity. So that would be a way of, of kind of bootstrapping your way into orbit. Uh, Arthur didn't pick up either one of those ideas. Uh, I guess he didn't care for that. Next slide. Uh, another interesting item is Arthur was always in his novels talking about extraterrestrials and how they might uh, interact with us. And as a matter of fact, in uh, uh, Fountains of Paradise, he has this star glider come by, which is a robotic spacecraft going from star to star. And it just swings through the solar system, picks up a little energy from the sun, changes this direction, and goes on somewhere else. Uh, and uh, that's kind of an interesting theme in, in, in his uh, novels. 
His Raghavan Brahma had a similar kind of theme about uh, aliens. Uh, <coughs> robots. But, you know, lately with all the discoveries of new planets, I've been I'm beginning to wonder about this. Uh, if you look at the galaxy here, uh, uh, here's a picture of you are here. You have 200 billion stars in this galaxy. They're discovering planets at such a, a fantastic rate. It looks like about, there's an average about one planet per star. If that's the case, we got 200 billion planets in our galaxy, many of them, you know, maybe a billion years old in the Earth, and nobody's called us yet. That's really strange. That, that leads to the, the Fermi's paradox. Next slide. Uh, we're looking at all these telescopes. They've discovered a couple thousand planets. Most stars seem to have planets. Earth is just half the age of the galaxy, and the aliens can colonize the galaxy in just a billion years at reasonable speeds. So the question is, Enrico Fermi, you put this in 1950 at Los Alamos, he says, well, where are they? Uh, and he realized that problem a long time ago. And he had three solutions to that problem. The first one was, they exist, they're here, and we're in a zoo. That's the first scientific explanation of flying saucers I'd ever heard. And that sounded kind of interesting, you know. Uh, the second was, civilizations destroy themselves uh, with nuclear wars or whatever or they lose interest in space and turn inward, and they never bother to go from star to star. And the final one is uh, extraterrestrials that don't exist, and this galaxy is ours. And I'm thinking that may be the way things actually are right now, because with all of the planets out there, and no contact, no indication of anybody out there, we may be alone in this galaxy. Next slide. Uh, Arthur picked up many accolades through his years. Uh, he got the Von Karman Award at the IAC in Beijing in 1996. He got multiple science fiction awards, Hugo Awards, Nebula you know, Awards, and all that. I think the uh, Fountains of Paradise got a, got a Hugo Award. There's an asteroid named Clark. Uh, asteroid 4923 is named Clark. Uh, the other two uh, authors, uh, Asimov has one named after him, but it uh, turns out Heinlein was already taken and couldn't give one to Robert Heinlein. There was a uh, a guy who was the head of a German uh, uh, space organization in, uh, who was named Heinlein, and there was a, an asteroid named after him, so can't have two Heinleins there. Uh, and he got the Sage of Science Fiction Awards, I mentioned it in, in 2000. But of course, the, the crowning achievement was uh, being knighted by Queen Elizabeth in 1998. Next slide, please. Uh, here are some selected works by Clark. I don't know how familiar you are with some of his science fiction or his science writings. But they're really something even nowadays. Uh, uh, I've gone back and reread some of his things, some of his novels from the uh, 40s and 50s, and he was really fantastic in those, in those areas. Uh, the uh, electromagnetic launching, uh, this is like uh, mass drivers on the moon. He wrote about that in 1940. Uh, and then, of course, his extraterrestrial relays in 45. Uh, space elevator uh, thought experiment at Keaton University in 1979. And then in the fiction area, Childhood's End, Sands of Mars, City in the Stars, and of course, 1968, the uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey with uh, Stanley Kubrick was a fantastic thing. And he did uh, The Fountains of Paradise, the first uh, space opera novel in 78, and then he came up with two more, uh, Odyssey 2 in 82 and 3001, the final Odyssey in 97, which talked about space elevators. So that was kind of interesting too. Next slide. Another slide? Okay. Uh, we just saw a few of these pictures that uh, Pete showed a little earlier. Uh, in addition to Arthur's uh, The Fountains of Paradise in 78, that same year Charles Sheffield came out with a completely independent uh, novel about uh, space elevators called The Web Between the Worlds, which was kind of interesting. They got together and talked about it. Uh, and he had a, a unique way of, of building an anchor. I don't know if anybody, uh, any of you have seen the Web Between the Worlds, or read that novel. Uh, yeah, he proposed uh, instead of uh, sending the material to Geo and then extending the space elevator in both directions until it anchors at the, uh, at the ground and, and put a counter at the top, uh, Sheffield proposed that you build it out in space and then you swing it by the Earth and then have it come by and, and touch the ground and be anchored. And uh, Arthur said, well, I don't know if that'll work or not, but I'm sure it wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Then, of course, there's Kim Stanley Robinson with the, the Red Mars series and Arthur's. And we've tried to do a space elevator novel uh, 
uh, motion picture uh, based on a space elevator. Uh, Arthur tried to get his uh, Fountains of Paradise made into a movie. We tried to do our movie. And I don't think there has yet been a movie on space elevators, which really surprises and disappoints me. I, I, there should have been a space elevator movie by now, but I don't know why. Next slide. Arthur was a giant in the science fiction world and the science world. He really had an impact in both of those areas. Uh, he did a lot of influential novels and words, and he was also influential in the technical world. People uh, in the technical area went to him and discussed things with him. I remember the uh, American general uh, when he had uh, launched a couple of uh, uh, communication satellites and they communicated with, with each other without going through the ground. He wrote a letter to Arthur saying, you know, we've, we've done what you said about in, in 1945, so wireless worked. So uh, that was kind of interesting there. And he was also a force in developing and publicizing the space elevator to the extent that uh, some people still associate Arthur's name with the invention of the space elevator. And the man was one of the most incredible hard workers I've ever seen. Uh, he kept multiple secretaries uh, busy keeping up with this stuff on three continents while he was working. And here he is in his office, uh, December 9, in 2007, when he was 90 years old. Gosh, I hope I can have the internet do something like that. And uh, we really lost one of our guy flights uh, when he died in 2008. That is the story of my relationship with Art Clark, and I'd be willing to entertain any questions you might have.